Hello Crew World. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. Now I'd like to tell you a story all about how the Pritchard criteria got figured out. So of all the assessments that I'm asked to do as an expert witness in criminal cases, by far the most common is a request for fitness to plead. So that's an assessment to see if somebody who's got a mental illness or is suspected of having a mental illness, if they are well enough to actually go through the trial process. So in this video, I'm gonna give you the background information into how that came about into law. I'm gonna talk about a couple of real life cases from literally hundreds of years ago where these rules were created and I'm going to tell you what the Pritchard criteria are and I'm also going to tell you what happens when a defendant has a finding of not guilty by reason of insanity. So sit back, grab a cappuccino and a textbook and an orange and enjoy this video. So in March 1831, Justice James Park, who's a judge obviously, was holding court in York and it was a very busy day because lots of people had come to see this particular trial. The trial was of a young woman in her early 20s called Esther Dyson. And she was indicted with willful murder of her bastard child by cutting its head off. I apologize for my language. I didn't say illegitimate because back then that was actually the terminology used formally for her charge. So she was asked whether she pled guilty or not guilty, but Esther just did not respond. It didn't matter how many times she was asked this question, there was no reply. So back then, or what I should say before then, there was a rule that you had to either plead guilty or not guilty and if you pled guilty then you have to agree to be tried by court and by God and if you didn't answer that question then the ritual couldn't begin and so if people were intentionally mute they used to do something called forty et dure so what they would do is they would take the defendant back into the cell time naked lie them on their back and get their arms and their legs on ropes and splay them out and they would put heavy objects like stones or iron on top of them to crush them so basically they torture them until they change their minds or until they died, whichever happened first. So that is what used to happen. Nowadays, obviously they get an assessment by somebody like me and I very rarely pull people's limbs apart or put iron on them, generally speaking. So then the judge does something that's never been done before. He gets a jury in to try and decide whether Esther Dyson was mute of malice or mute of visitation by God. So was she doing it on purpose, just to be difficult, or was there a legitimate reason, such as mental illness, that she couldn't speak? And then they got her supervisor from the cotton mill factory where she worked for many years, and he explained that she was born deaf and mute, so she couldn't communicate. So this supervisor used sign language to communicate with her, and Esther eventually put in a glee of not guilty. However, as they were going through the court process and he was communicating, it became quite apparent quite quickly that she couldn't understand a lot of what was going on, which as I'll explain later, comes back to being fit to plead. So eventually the judge stopped the trial and decided to send her to West Rider Pauper Lunatic Asylum, where she spent the next 38 years of her life and where she died. I Googled it, only got two stars on TripAdvisor. Only kidding. And then five years later, in 1836, there was a case of a man named Mr. Pritchard, who was also deaf and dumb. He was accused of bestiality. Or is it bestiality? I can never tell which one it is, but luckily I don't have to say that word that often, so it probably doesn't matter. And the judge in that case decided to look back at Dyson's case and made these new rules, which are called, after Mr. Pritchard, the Pritchard criteria. So these are the rules about whether or not it's fit to plead. As for the outcome of uh, Pritchard's bestiality case, I'm afraid I don't know any more details. I did try and do some research. I Googled bestiality and woof, Let's just say there's some things that you cannot unsee. So what are the Pritchard criteria? So the defendant to be fit to plead, they have to be able to enter a plea. So they have to say guilty or not guilty. And crucially, they have to understand what that plea means. So if, for example, they've got a learning disability, it's not enough that they just say the word. They have to explain to me during my assessment that they understand the consequences of what not guilty means versus what guilty means. They have to instruct the defense team or they have to be able to do that. So they can't just say to the lawyer, I'm not guilty. They have to explain their version of events and just basically their perspective. They have to be able to give evidence or be able to give evidence in their case or follow evidence. 
and they have to follow court proceedings, which is similar but not quite the same because court proceedings is everything from what the judge is saying to what the barrister is saying. They have to have the intellectual and cognitive ability to follow that process. And finally, they have to be able to challenge a juror. So contrary to what some people might think, challenging a juror has got nothing to do with actually disagreeing with what a juror says because a juror doesn't speak during a trial process. It's about whether somebody is, is appropriate for that person to be on the jury. So for example, if a defendant had beef with somebody from many years ago, you know, had a fight at school and that person's on the jury, for the defendant to be fit to plead, they have to be able to say, hey, that person's not impartial, they shouldn't be on the jury. And if a defendant can't do any one of those things, then by definition, they're not fit to plead. Sometimes when somebody's not fit to plead, it might be a temporary problem. So they might have like a drug-induced psychosis, which typically only lasts a couple of days. I've got a video on that if you're interested, check it out. Or they might have an acute schizophrenia that they only had a relapse because they stopped their medication, but once they're back on their meds within a few weeks, they might be fit to plead. Or they might have a long-term illness, such as a severe psychosis like schizophrenia, which even with the best medication, they're not gonna get sufficiently better, or something like severe dementia. So those things are permanently not fit to plead. So before I answer the question, what happens if somebody's found unfit to plead? I'm gonna quickly introduce you to this channel. This is a site for sore minds. I am Dr. Shahan Das, consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders, in courts and in prisons and in psychiatric units. This video covers a whole range of different topics related to mental illness, some relating to violence and offending because that's my speciality and some more common to the average person. I sometimes talk about my own cases anonymized, so don't try and get me in trouble, uh, or I interview ex-patients or people with experience of mental health issues. There's something for everybody on this channel, go check it out. Okay, so what happens if a judge finds that somebody's not fit to plead? In terms of sentencing, so in terms of the decision that the judge makes about the disposal of the case, there's three options. They can either completely drop the case, which can happen if the case isn't that serious and they don't think that the defendant is risky. So a couple of years ago, I saw a young lady with Down syndrome who kind of escaped from her uh, care home, went on a bus, got quite agitated because she didn't understand what was going on, uh, sort of shouted, screamed, smashed a window. Nobody got hurt, wasn't a lot of damage. So I think that, and she was unfit to plead because of her downs. And I think the judge accepted that it wasn't particularly dangerous and they dropped the case. Or they could have somebody go to a psychiatric hospital on a hospital order. So even though they're technically not guilty, they still might need long-term rehabilitation. So off the top of my head, a few months ago, I assessed somebody with schizophrenia who stabbed his neighbor randomly due to paranoid delusions, too unwell to plead in his case, probably wouldn't get significantly better, at least not for a couple of years, instead of waiting for him to get better he had a hospital order so he went to a secure unit for long-term rehabilitation or there's a supervision order so that is when a probation a parole officer or a social worker feel is able to look after that patient in the community and there might be conditions like taking medication etc so they're deemed that case is deemed not so um, serious that the person needs to go to hospital but also not so mild that the case can be dropped so it's somewhere in between. And that's basically it. That, that, those are the basics of the Pritchard criteria, what the consequences are and the history, the case law behind it. Hope you enjoyed this video. Hope it's shed some light if you're in, into this kind of thing. It's important for me because, as I said, this is a very common assessment I do. It was something that I was taught about whilst doing my training as a specialist registrar. Hope you found it helpful. Okay, that's enough from me. Go off and do whatever you have to do today. Remember, stay euthymic and please don't forget, I love you.